coming up on Network Africa. South Africans vote in national and provincial elections across the country. Madagascar holds the key parliamentary election, plus. Egypt to host Sudanese civil and political groups to discuss ending the war. Oh, it's D-Day in South Africa as citizens are at polling centres to vote across the country for a new parliament and nine provincial legislatures. Polls have opened across the country since 7 a.m. with queues in many polling stations in spite of initial delays in some centres. Over 27 million people are registered to cast their ballots in this election that is crucial for the ruling party African National Congress. The ANC is facing the possibility of losing its majority for the first time since 1994. However, as President Cyril Ramaphosa cast his vote in Soweto, he said he has no doubt that the people would once more show confidence in the African National Congress. A whopping 70 parties and 11 independents are jostling for positions in the national and provincial elections. And Nigeria's former president, Goodluck Jonathan, who is leading a team of election observers in South Africa, says he is concerned about the country's new registration procedures. He says the worry is about people who have not gone to their provinces to vote, because previously voters could cast their ballots in major cities like Pretoria, Johannesburg, or Cape Town without much hassle. But this time, voters needed to apply to the Electoral Commission for reassignment if they wanted to vote outside their registered province. Mr. Jonathan, who led Nigeria from 2010 to 2015, says many voters had not completed this process, mistakenly believing they could vote as before. Uh, in the meantime, the House Committee Chairman on Electoral Reforms in Nigeria and the Senate Committee Chair on Electoral Matters are also part of the election observation delegation and they both speak on reforms to Nigeria's electoral laws which they will be inculcating, especially the concept of special voting. Well, some of the areas I think need to be of, of use is the inclusion of the inmates, people in the correctional centers in the electoral process. Uh, though there have been presentations already in Nigeria, we are still working on the bill, but with the experience here, I think it's, it's a lovely approach we will be able to actually put more consideration into that. And uh, again, the issue of special centers for people who have special uh, duties, I think it's something we we'll should put into consideration in Nigeria because if you look at the number of people who are going to be on special, uh, special duties, it's, I think it's over one million in, in, in South Africa here. And I think if we should just approach that to Nigeria, we should be getting way back to three million. So this is a real good number of people. Well, uh, what I've seen is that there's the opportunity for diaspora voting here. And, but that is limited to only people who work in the embassies across the world, in the missions. Also, there is also the opportunity of special voting for people who probably are weak. Where is that place? Weak. People who probably are weak or at clinics. There is also a way of going to correctional centers. These are some things that I see. Uh, that one can one of the take some of the sticky ways on that from here. Yeah. Well, elections started on time in many parts of South Africa with large turnout of voters in places like Midrand, Tembisa and Pretoria. Our correspondent, Kayla Maguire, who observed the election in these areas, uh, reports that the exercise went on without incident as party members and citizens came out en masse to exercise their franchise.
our correspondent in Johannesburg, Innocent Samosa, joins us now for more on the elections. Hello, Innocent. Uh, the, fi the day has finally come, D-Day in South Africa. Tell us, how has it been on the field covering the voting process? And I believe you have cast your vote. Well, a very good evening to you, colleagues, and our viewers around the world. Indeed, it has been a busy, busy day here in South Africa. I guess it's going to be a busy week as results will be trickling in. Uh, but of course, I've not casted my vote yet. Uh, in fact, after this uh, live processing, I'll be making my way to four ways where I'll be casting my vote. But of course, we've been following the two presidents, that is former President Thabo Mbeki and former President Halema Mujante, who, of course, they have uh, made it clear that they support, they voted for the African National Congress. But the Former President Thabo Mbeki has also uh, made it clear that he's calling for the renewal of the African National Congress. You would recall that there was a time when he was not happy with the African National Congress. And at times he said that he's not going to campaign for the ANC simply because they're not... Uh, uh, they're not true to what they promised the people. So, but today we had um, him again, uh, you know, emphasizing the call for the renewal of the African National Congress. On the other hand, former President Palema Mutlante also came, uh, cast up his vote. Um, but he also, I put a question to him, in fact, to ask him, because he was on the ground, he was campaigning, ask him if whether or not him engaging with citizens does did this give him an understanding or an idea of how South Africans live? And he said that his answer was simple. He said that he's living with South Africans. It's the, the conditions of South Africans are not new. So it was a really interesting day and interesting views coming from uh, these two presidents, Layo. Now talk to us about the safety and security so far. Have you heard of you know any disruptions or delays? <laughs> Well, we've not had major incidents reported, but some of them are on social media. You would know that there's issues of, uh, uh, you know, uh, fake news that are circulating on social media. If it's not really uh, authentic or if the IEC has not said anything about that incident, um, that could very well be that the issue is really under investigation or is, is not true. Uh, there's one in KZN where we heard that there was a car that was transporting uh, papers of the economic freedom fighters and T-shirts of the economic freedom fighters. And the, they, there was a taxi strike subsequent to that. Um, we have seen people looting shops wearing uh, T-shirts of the economic freedom fighters, but the EFF has really come out, came out to say that those people are not the supporters of the uh, economic freedom fighters. But over and above, here yeah, in, in, in Gauteng, in the suburbs, I must say that the services are much better than in the townships. In fact, where former President Thabo Mbeki and former President Khalima Mutlante voted, the services were quite smooth, uh, for a lack of a better term. But when we went to the other part of the north side of uh, Johannesburg, that is Cosmo City, people were in Runbeck also, people were complaining that the boots are just not enough. In fact, some of them wanted to even leave without voting simply because they're tired, they are hungry, they've been on the queue for more than two hours. And also there was a, there's a school in Houghton uh, Primary School where there was disruption of electricity. Uh, the systems were down. They could not continue simply because uh, there was no electricity. So people had to wait for hours for, for, for the system to come back online. So those are some of the major uh, uh, minor issues that we've really witnessed. But so far, no major issues reported, Lyo. Yeah, uh, in a sense. And we know that, you know, voting will be closing at 9 p.m. local time. When can we expect results of the elections? I guess it's difficult to tell for now, but I would imagine, I would, I would, I guess perhaps maybe by Sunday we could be having some results. But I guess um, they said that they don't want to make it run into the weekend. Um, but with the issues, these constraints that we've been witnessing where uh, people have, you know, uh, uh, difficulties of, of voting. So I guess that might delay the process. But I guess around Sunday, we, we might be expecting to hear some of the results. Laya. 
All right, then. Thank you so much. Uh, in a sense, Samosa, our correspondent in Johannesburg, uh, let's let you go so you can cast your vote. Thank you, colleague. Well, earlier on, Innocent uh, filed in this report of former South African presidents Thabo Mbeki and Kalema Motlante emphasizing the importance of the 2024 elections. Both leaders cast their ballots at the Kilani Country Club in Joburg. Now, first-time voters acknowledge that voting alone, alone would, would not solve all the country's issues, but is urging all South Africans to exercise their right to vote for the sake of the nation's democracy. Well, it's a big day. It's a big week for South Africa. The country is going to the polls. We do know that this took months and months of preparation from the Independent Electoral Commission to ensure that they run a successful election. Former President Thabo Mbeki is calling for the renewal of the African National Congress. I think it's also going to be important uh, that the ANC must do what it says about itself. The ANC has been saying it must renew itself. So the ANC must do that. It's important because it's got a very important role to play in terms of the future of the country. Meanwhile, former President Khalema Mutlante says this marks a major milestone in South Africa's democracy. Well, 30 years is a milestone. Uh, there will be 60 years as a milestone. There will be 100 years as a milestone. And, and so <clears throat> this 30 years is special to us because, uh, you know, it, it marks a, a major milestone uh, in our journey into our democracy. And, and we are building this democracy because democracy is not a complete package that, uh, you know, once declared where, you know, takes care of every facet of life. Democracy is built brick by brick, patiently, and, and you do and uh, learn as you do. Yeah. First time voters shared their experience. Uh, a little bit underwhelmed. I think there's big problems with the system. A lot of the people in there didn't know what they were doing. People couldn't find their names in the books. They didn't know where to look, who to tell. We had to find the number for them, show them where to look for people and try and make a plan. It was very all over the place, but glad we got it done in the end. Yeah, also a bit frustrated because, um, you know, you do everything right before to make it smooth. We got here really early and yeah. Well, both former President Thabo Mbeki and Khalema Mutlante says that they are impressed with the voting process where they essentially voted. But here in Runbeck, it's a different scene altogether. The queues are long and of course some of them, they're even thinking of leaving the queues because the voting booths are just not enough. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Innocent Samosa, Channel Television News. Still ahead on the program, Nigeria has a new national anthem, which is her old national anthem. We'll give you more details. Please join us again. Welcome back to the program. People in Madagascar are also voting in parliamentary elections, uh, which the ruling party hopes to retain its majority. The Tanora Malagasy Vonona party of the president, Andrzej Rajelina, won 84 out of 151 seats in the last election. President Rajelina himself controversially won re-election last November. The vote was marred by low turnout uh, and a boycott by the opposition. According to the Independent National Electoral Commission, 12 million people are eligible to cast ballots in Wednesday's exercise. The African Union and a grouping of Southern African countries, SADC, uh, have their observers on ground to the island nation. Egypt has invited Sudanese civil society and political groups to a conference to discuss ways to end the war in the country. The meeting is planned for late June and it aims to reach a consensus among the various Sudanese civil political forces on ways to build lasting peace in Sudan. The conference is the latest effort by Sudan's neighbours to try to end a devastating war that is now in its second year. 
previous interventions by regional bloc, IGAD, Ethiopia and Kenya to broker a peace deal have all failed. Meanwhile, the International Organization for Migration, IOM, estimates that the conflict in Sudan has displaced nearly 58,000 people from El Fasha, and that's in northern Darfur, since April 1st. Many more people, including children and the elderly, are unable or are being prevented from moving to safe areas. Hundreds of thousands of civilians in El Fasha are facing an increasingly dire humanitarian situation. Many parts of the city have been left without electricity or water. Now, a growing proportion of the population has limited access to necessities and also essential services, including food and health care. According to reports in the past day, medical facilities, displacement camps and critical civilian infrastructure have also been impacted by the hostilities. Algeria is circulating a proposed UN Security Council resolution that would demand an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and also to order Israel to halt its military offensive in the southern city of Rafah immediately. The draft resolution also demands that the ceasefire be respected by all parties. Algeria is also calling for the immediate release of all hostages taken during the Hamas attack in southern Israel in October. Some diplomats say they hope for a quick vote on the resolution and the draft demands compliance with previous Security Council resolutions that call for the opening of all border crossings and humanitarian access to Gaza's 2.3 million people who desperately need food and other humanitarian aid. The European Commission is allocating 201 million euros in EU humanitarian funding to help the most vulnerable people affected by humanitarian crisis in Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Chad, Mali, Mauritania, Niger and Nigeria. EU Commissioner for Crisis Management, Janice uh, Lenarkic, announced the funding during the senior officials meeting on Sahel and Lake Chad, which held in Brussels. The funding will support food security, malnutrition assistance, health care, protection, water sanitation, hygiene, shelter, education activities, and the transportation of humanitarian workers and supplies to remote and inaccessible locations. According to the EU, uh, the response to humanitarian assistance will continue to prioritize countries and areas that are directly affected by ongoing insecurity and conflict, including the coastal countries of West Africa that the spillover from Central Sahel has impacted. Back here in Nigeria, the Lagos State Government, in partnership with a non-governmental organization, V-Care for Development Foundation, is set to distribute over 20,000 sanitary pads to female students across secondary schools in the state. The state's special advisor on health, Dr. Kemi Ogunyemi, disclosed this during a press briefing at Alausa Ikeja to commemorate World Menstrual Hygiene Day 2024. She says aside, aside from the distribution of sanitary pads, 500,000 female students will also be educated on how to maintain hygiene during menstruation. Reproductive health rights, gender equality and youth empowerment resonate loud in the themes plus agenda of this administration which ensures the inclusion of all citizens, regardless of their social or gender status. We commemorate the World Menstrual Hygiene Day to reiterate these priority areas with special focus on the menstrual hygiene, which affects many of our female citizens. The World Menstrual Hygiene Day is a global campaign which provides essential information to affected females and galvanizes support from relatives, governments, private and non-governmental organizations to promote information on good menstrual hygiene. The theme for this year's World Menstrual Hygiene Day is Together for a Period-Friendly World, which ensures that the stigma and taboos surrounding menstrual, menstruation are history, promotes equal access to products, health education, and accessibility to period-friendly infrastructure for menstruating females. Menstrual hygiene is a public health issue which affects, that affects the health, well-being, and dignity of women and girls around the world. 
Access to resources and infrastructure are fundamental rights to women and adolescent girls, which are key to menstrual hygiene. France continues to seek ways to build partnerships with Nigeria and Nigerians. This time, it's promoting education in France, whatever the cost of study, with the advantage of learning the French language. Recently, the French emb embassy and Campus France Nigeria held the second edition of the France Alumni Day, an event to highlight an alumni journey and to help them network among themselves while seeking career opportunities within the French and Nigerian business community in Nigeria. Alumni spoke about the advantages of studying in France and the opportunities learning the language has opened to them. French language is one of the major languages in international relations and diplomacy. So if you want to work in, I don't know, uh, international organizations such as the um, UN, you know, UNESCO, um, Red Cross, ECOWAS, African Union, you know, French language is an added advantage, right? It's also one of the major languages in technology and, you know, science. Also fashion, you know, cuisine. It's very, it's, it, it's, it's, it gives you like um, business and cultural opportunities in that regard. For me, in the space that I'm in, the creative space, really doesn't have any doors, really. So the people that come in are from different works of life. So now I'm not only able to communicate or express my design or my creativity with English speakers, I'm also able to bridge the gap with French speakers as well. And for me, because I have a history and a passion with the French culture, it's a door that I like to open and I like to explore. For me, the French speaking language make you more friendly to communicate with people. But un unfortunately, during my studies, I was more focused on the business side of my business. So yeah, of course, when you, when you speak French, you easily communicate with the entire culture. In my case, when I was in school, when I want to approach a lot of companies, I always go with an interpreter, you know, because I speak English, my, my studies was in English, my work was in English, but when you speak French, it makes you, it gives you this free access to everything that you need in France. And finally, on the program, Nigeria's President Bola Tinubu has assented to the bill reverting to the old national anthem, Nigeria, we hail thee. The signing of the bill into law came after the bill was passed by the Senate and House of Representatives. President of the Senate, Godswill Akpabio, informed members of the National Assembly that the national anthem bill was signed into law by the president this morning. The old anthem, Nigeria We Hail Thee, was composed when Nigeria gained independence on October 1st, 1960. It now replaces the Arise or Compatriots anthem. Lillian John Williams, a British expatriate who lived in Nigeria, during the independence, penned the lyrics for Nigeria We Hail Thee, while Francis Berda composed the music. The anthem played a significant role in shaping Nigeria's national identity and unity during the 1960s and late 1970s. I guess we have much to learn on this new old anthem. That's it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo Olarede. Thank you.